Hello, I'm Todd Krieger, president of the Young Adult Library Services Association, YALSA. I'd like to welcome you to the Odyssey Award ceremony. We're here today to celebrate the 2020 Odyssey Award winner and honor audiobook winners. And hello from me, Cecilia McGowan, president of the Association for Library Service to Children. I'm thrilled to be sharing this virtual celebration with Todd as ALSC and YALSA share the conferring of this award. It's vitally important to celebrate audiobooks, which bring stories to life in new and accessible ways. As we're all experiencing now, hearing a good story can be transformative. Today, we will hear from some of our award-winning producers, authors, and narrators. The teams behind the honor titles Redwood and Ponytail, Song for a Whale, We're Not From Here, We Are Grateful, Ojali Haliga, and the winner, Hey Kiddo, How I Lost My Mother, Found My Father, and Dealt With Family Addiction. We'll learn a little more about production and even hear some live recordings. I'd like to welcome our winning producers, narrators, and authors, families and friends, and representatives from Hachette Audio, Listening Library, and imprint of Penguin Random House Audio Publishing Group, Live Oak Media, and Scholastic Audiobooks for joining us, along with all the readers and listeners at home. I would also like to thank the ALSC and YALSA staff for their hard work putting these ceremonies together, and Heather Booth, Audio Editor of Booklist the sponsor of the Odyssey Award. Finally, the 2020 Odyssey Committee for their selections and celebrations for this award. We will now turn the program over to Sharon Helft, Chair of the 2020 Odyssey Award Selection Committee. So I would like to introduce you and say thank you to my wonderful 2020 Odyssey Committee. And they would like to offer their thanks and congratulations to our Odyssey winner and honor books. Yay! Yay congratulations! Yay. Yay! Hi, and welcome to the 2020 Annual Odyssey Award presentations. I'm Sharon Haupt chair of the 2020 Odyssey Award Committee. The Odyssey Award is sponsored by Booklist and administered by ALSC, the Association for Library Service to Children, and YALSA, the Young Adult Library Services Association. This annual award is presented to the producer of the best audiobook produced for young people, zero to 18 years of age, available in English in the United States. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the enthusiastic and hardworking members of the Odyssey Award Committee for their dedication and excellent work. In 2019, the committee received over 700 audiobook submissions with a total listening time adding up to 1,285 eight-hour days. Phew. So what did we do while listening? This group knitted, walked for miles, crafted, did jigsaw puzzles, weeded yards, cleaned closets, and listened even while sheltering from a typhoon. We spent hours together at ALA annual and midwinter meetings and sifted through over 3,500 emails and group posts in our journey to find productions that were creative, innovative, and truly unique for the auditory experience of their intended audience. I'd also be remiss if I didn't highlight the support and assistance of Heather Booth, our book list consultant, as well as ALSC's priority group consultant, Carol Phillips. Without further ado, the 2020 Odyssey Award Committee selected four audio honor titles. In alphabetical order by title, they are Redwood and Ponytail, written by K.A. Holt, and read by Tessa Netting and Cassandra Morris, produced by Hachette Audio. Two voices, two girls, and two perspectives combined a powerful effect in this novel and verse about middle school, first love, and self-discovery. Through dynamic and expressive performances, Cassandra Morris and Tessa Netting capture the yearning, confusion, and intensity found within the hearts of two girls. And now, Please enjoy this conversation with the team involved in creating this production. 
Hello and welcome to the 2020 Odyssey Award Honor Ceremony for the book Redwood and Ponytail by Carrie Ann Holt and narrated by Cassandra Morris and Tessa Netting and produced by Dennis Cow from Hachette Audio. So we are so thrilled to have all of you here and thank you so much. And at this point, Dennis, I would like to present to you the Odyssey o Honor Award for Redwood and Ponytail. So I'm gonna give you a round of applause <laughs> and ask you to speak a bit. Thank you very much. I've been an admirer of the, the ALA for a long time. And I want to thank the author first and foremost. This is a really innovative book. When we were looking at it, we were like, wow, it's, it's, a, it's a poem, you know, but it tells a really engaging story. I want to thank the actors. There's three others, too, that, that I mean, they played the, uh, you know, the Alexis. But, um, you know, obviously Tessa and Cassandra really brought it to life. and. Um, you know, they were chosen from like, probably like 40 auditions. Um, and uh, so I think they were perfect for it. And uh, beyond that, I, I, I wish I could say I had uh, more to, to do with its success and its quality, but it's really the writing and then the actors and then um, you know, the sound editor really put the timing together because that's a, uh, a part of the process which in audiobooks is not really appreciated. They can really make or break kind of like the rhythm and the engagement and the flow. So uh, the, the editor, Jared, really did an amazing job too. So Dennis, um, this question is posed by my Odyssey committee member, Robin Brenner. And she mentions that, you know, obviously this is a novel in verse. And so can you tell us about how you thought about differentiating the audio to mimic and help the listener understand the physical placement of words on the page and um, how that all came together? So, so it, it's, it would be impossible to show, because a lot of the times, you know, um, they, they're in different columns, the dialogue. So we can't really, we couldn't really show that, but it's obvious that someone is talking and then someone is responding. So it's, it was very clear to us, you know, it's a, the, the dialogue was going back and forth in certain parts. So I um, didn't really do, didn't really convey how it looks like on the written page. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's just kind of like in audio, it's converted into dialogue. And, uh, and, and the sections were delineated by the, the different, uh, the main characters and the yeah. leaks. Well, you know, oftentimes it sounded like a duet almost with the way that they were talking and the pacing and so Cassandra and, and Tessa, do you have anything um, to, to contribute about how you created that feeling, how that, that inner dialogue and that inner journey and these two characters were having as they met? Yeah, I mean, it was such a beautiful story and the challenge for me really was trying to convey the prose and like get into a rhythm so the listener would be able to experience the prose the way a reader would so that's what I tried to do with the pacing um, and there's so many like there's so many places to like take a breath and like take a moment and let things sink in um, that are conveyed by the text so that's what I tried to bring to the performance. Um, but overall, like I, I was so excited when I found out that I was going to be narrating this book. Like I love, I love middle grade, and then just the fact that it's an LGBTQ book is like we need more voices like that, especially in middle grade. So I, I'm just, it's just such an honor to be part of the book, and then to receive this as well. It's like icing on the cake. 
so yeah it's so true cassandra put it perfectly just it was an honor to be a part of this and to tell such like a beautiful and personal story and i think when i um was playing this character it was just trying to get as connected with my own feelings and with my own thoughts and with my own struggle with my sexuality like i kind of put my own sort of <laughs> things that i had never dealt with on top of that so it was it was very therapeutic and very beautiful and very um just so cool and when i finally got to listen to it all together and sort of hear our voices overlapping it was it just blew my mind because i i hadn't heard that like in the booth you're just kind of um trying to get your character across and then to hear kind of like a melody it was like a sort of both of our voices going in and out it was it was perfect it was so our our voices were um they matched so well and i think it just told the story so well and it was great <laughs> such a good experience so really, yeah. um when you heard this audio for the first time what what went through your mind i mean what did you think did you was it even what you expected it's as a writer it's it's one of these things when your characters come alive you know when you hear their voices it's uh very strange <laughs> like it's it's really great that that you know they're three dimensional but it's also it's hard to explain because like i the way that i have come to know the characters um having that come alive takes a minute to like sit back and go oh yeah yes okay here they are here they are they're alive and and it i don't know it makes my heart race it's hard for me to listen to it uh, all the way through <laughs> because they're so real and like they've been so real to me all along that when i hear actual human voices it makes me feel terrible for the things that i have put them through but i loved it and like when i found out that they were making um an audiobook of redwood and ponytail i could not imagine how it was going to happen which is funny because as i was writing i was definitely thinking of it as a kind of duet thing and i was reading it out loud to make sure i could like hit all the beats in the right way so obviously i knew that there was an audio component possible but i had no idea how it was going to be pulled off um and i think it was pulled off magnificently It was abs absolutely wonderful and I would just like to say congratulations again to all of you for producing and writing such a wonderful and momentous book. It was it was just heartwarming. Congratulations to all of you for a job well done. We so all appreciate it and thank you for sharing your gifts and talents with all of our young children and adults. And now here is a clip to uh, from Redwood and Ponytail. Tam. I dig the heel of my palm, calmly pressing into my chest, harder and harder. Because I know it's there. It has to be somewhere, beating. Kate. I stare out the window, the sun huge, bright, burning, taking up the whole sky. And it's like I can see inside my chest, my, my heart, heart, my high heart. heart. My heart. heart. So why does it feel missing? Skipping every beat. Nothing alive inside me. Bursting too full. It hurts so much. All the feelings pressed into my ribs, like my eyes to the window. Could it be that my palm digs calmly because you can't panic when you have no beats? Could it be that all the feelings are exploding at once, finally free? My heart, my heart, my heart, my heart, my heart, my heart. Where are you? Where could you be? Why would you leave me here? So quiet. So empty. Why are you like this? Why do this to me? Why aren't you normal? Why can't you leave me be? Tam, what does it mean to be a friend? Song for a Whale, written by Lynn Kelly and read by Abigail Ravash. 
produced by Listening Library, an imprint of Penguin Random House Audio. Ravash's narration honors the linguistic beauty of American Sign Language by emulating the experience of listening to a person who is simultaneously speaking and signing. On this journey fraught with frustrations and surprising joys, the desire to belong plunges Iris and the whale known as Blue 55 on an insightful mission of communication. Please enjoy this conversation with the team involved in creating this production. We would like to welcome the team that is the Odyssey Honor for Song for a Whale, written by Lynn Kelly and narrated by Abigail Ravash and produced by Aaron Blank and the team at Listening Library, an imprint of Penguin Random House Audio. I would really like to offer to Aaron congratulations and give you the um, 2020 Odyssey Honor Award for Song for a Whale. I would like to thank the Odyssey Committee and Chair Sharon Haupt for recognizing Song for a Whale, as well as ALSK, YALSA, and Booklist for their support of this award. Books that I have a connection to and resonate with me are the most meaningful to produce. Song for a Whale is just that sort of book. I have always felt a little like an outsider in life, so of course I fell in love with Lynn's book from the dedication, for everyone who's ever felt alone. As a kid, I loved to tinker and fix things. I still do. And that made me connect with Iris, the voice of this story, even more. Her discovery at Bridgewood Junior High of its deaf teachers is a very touching moment. And the parallels between the whale, known as Blue 55, and Iris resonate deeply within me. I think they will also for anyone who feels like they've ever been excluded. None of us would be here today without two people, Lynn Kelly and Abigail Ravash. Lynn, our gifted, talented, and caring author. And considering voices, you and I were on the same page that Abigail was the perfect narrator. Abigail, you gave each chapter a subtle tone and uniqueness that's delicate and very appropriate, including Iris's one spoken line. Hi, it's Iris, I'm here. My job as producer is to bring the best players to the stage and give them room to work. So I must thank our director as well, Andrea Kaufman. Thank you all for this honor and your commitment to outstanding audiobooks. Um, we wanted to ask um, Abigail, can you, did you sign while you were doing this at all? Do you know sign language at all? I don't. Um, I do remember learning a little bit as a child. Um, I've always had a fascination with languages and indeed my best friend since I was very young, in fact, was deaf, is deaf. And, uh, but, but he did not sign. He was a lip reader. So um, I think it was a combination of probably both of those things. I do speak a lot of languages and uh, I just sort of think in I don't know. <laughs> I think in words we all do, but you know, I think given uh, being a voiceover artist for all these years and a writer, um, you know, Lynn's words were just beautiful, and just everything was right there on the page. Lynn, you talk so much about um, not only Blue Fifty Five, the whale, but you also just talked about that deaf, deaf experience. Can you share a little bit more about? how you came to put the two together? The whale came first in this story. I, um, the story idea came from just me finding out that this whale existed, um, who kind of had his own language in a way. And I was fascinated right away and learned all that I could about him and found really the only thing we know is this unusual song. So no one has um, taken a picture, you know, seen this whale in real life that the story is based on. And pretty soon I, I knew this has to be something to write about. I didn't know what the story would be yet, but I knew this was an idea that wouldn't let me go. And so of course I needed a character. And I thought, well, who would be someone who's not just fascinated like I am, but someone who will actually get up and go do something to feel like, who, who would feel like she has to reach out to this whale and let him know that someone does hear this song in a way. And so thinking of who that character is um, led me to think about many deaf students that I've worked with in my 
career as a sign language interpreter. Um, the students I worked with um, were never the only deaf kid in school, but they were often one of a few. And it, it does happen often that a deaf kid is the only one in school. So um, even if there's only a few, that's a very small pool of people you can actually communicate with at school. And so it can be very isolating, even though um, they're surrounded by other people, but still feel lonely at the same time. And so I knew that's, that would be who my character is, someone who has that experience and would feel like when she learns about this whale, she feels like they have the same life in a way, in that they're surrounded by others, yet isolated at the same time. That, that is um, something that we commented on when we were discussing the audio about how um, there were so many people around and yet there was so much silence and how much that was recognized and honored in the story. So thank you. So at this point, so Abigail, at this point, there's a clip that has been chosen to, for you to read. What can you tell us about what she might be hearing? The thing about communication, right, is that ultimately words are just sound. It's just one vehicle. It's just one vehicle. We're never communicating that, right? That's just like the pathway. And there's so much about communication that happens that's visual, that's emotional, that's us even sensing each other. I think brain to brain, right? Amygdala to amygdala. We sense each other in our brains quite literally and um and so i think it's so beautiful in this particular scene how they're using the piano and the feeling of the piano the touch to communicate right and how they find another language another way to say this is what it would feel like this is what that difference is that we can't understand it's about this whale what kind of whale? Not a kind of whale, just one specific whale. I learned about him in science. I placed a hand on top of the piano, and Wendell did the same thing. At the top of the page, I'd written, regular whales, 28 hertz, first piano key, 35 hertz, fifth key. With one finger, I struck the key on the far left. The low sound vibrated against my palm. I played it a few times so we could get to know the sound. Then I did the same thing with each key up to the fifth one, a black one that played 35 hertz. Blue and fin whales didn't sing much higher than that. On the next line of the page, I'd written 55 hertz, 13th piano key. I counted over starting from the first key until I landed on number 13, a white key this time. I played the note a few times and the vibration tickled my palm again, a bit lighter than the others. So this whale, I explained to Wendell, that's what he sounds like. I hit the key again, but here's what he's supposed to sound like. I struck the first key again, so he can't talk to other whales. Wendell placed both hands on top of the piano as I alternated between the two notes. Not much of a difference, he signed. It's a big difference for whales. Thank you so much, that was really wonderful. And thank you to the team at Penguin Random House Listening Library and for Aaron and Lynn and everyone for all of their hard work in putting this beautiful audio together. Thank you. We're Not From Here by Jeff Rodkey, read by Danny Martinick and produced by Listening Library in imprint of Penguin Random House Audio. The fate of humankind rests on the family Mifune, desperately seeking asylum on planet Chum. Narrator Danny Martinek shares the Mifune's precarious situation with well-timed comic relief as our protagonists navigate hostile inhabitants. It's an emotional roller coaster ride leading to interspecies cooperation and understanding. Please enjoy this conversation with the team involved in creating this production.
So welcome to the um, Odyssey Award presentation for the honor book, We're Not From Here, by Jeff Rodkey, and narrated by Danny Martinek, produced by Nick Mortarelli, and produced by the uh, team at Listening Library, an imprint of Penguin Random House Audio. Nick, we are honored to present to you the Odyssey Honor Award for We're Not From Here for 2020. Congratulations on a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am a huge fan of science fiction, of stories that transport us to new worlds and far-flung futures, and yet always understand that wrapped up in starships and laser guns. These novels are always about addressing the concerns of the here and the now. So when I first read Jeff Rodkey's We're Not From Here, I instantly saw what he was doing. He was exploring the topic of immigration through a sci-fi lens, casting humans as the immigrants moving to a foreign alien planet. It's set in the future with humans moving from Earth to planet Chune. And this book could be about anyone, any child, any boy or girl, being forced to abandon the only home they've known and enter a strange new environment. But the, book, but the book also addresses issues of cultural diversity, of making friendships across lines of identity and the importance and the power of art. So while speaking about strangers in the future, Jeff's book addresses our current moment here on earth with all the humor and the light touches that a book for middle schoolers requires. So I'm honored to have this audiobook recognized, and I want to thank Sharon Haupt and the Odyssey Committee Chair, the all the 2020 committee members for their many hours of thoughtful listening, and to ALSK, YALSA, and Booklist for their continued support and commitment to recognizing excellence in audiobooks. I also want to thank Danny Martinek for their stellar, thoughtful performance that brings the book to life, Maureen Monterubio for her insightful direction, and of course, for Jeff, for giving us this amazing adventure to take. Now, more than ever, we need books to expand our horizons, introduce us to new ideas, and continue to take us to the strange new worlds we might only dream of. Thank you. So this um, question is posed by my committee member, Beth Rosania, and sh she noted that this was the narrator's first audiobook recording, which is absolutely amazing. What a great project to start with. So we wanted to know what it's like working with a new narrator and how were the vocalizations decided on for each character and how were you able to sustain those and their personalities throughout this amazing adventure? Uh, I've actually known Danny for uh, a number of years now, but I was emailing with Jeff about casting this book. And we had been talking about the narrator we wanted and uh, trying to figure out who that would be. And I happened to spend that week seeing a play down in Brooklyn. And Danny was in the cast of the play. And then we went out for drinks afterwards and I asked them, I was like, you ever thought about this audiobook thing? I have this project that I'd really like to audition you for if you're up for it. And of course they said yes and they crushed it they got and obviously they got the job uh and then i'll turn it now over to danny to talk about the experience of actually getting in there and recording and working with uh, their director maureen yes thank you our director maureen who funnily enough i've also known for years because we went to high school together down in tennessee who knew it was our reunion it was a great reunion and I was so grateful and blessed to be able to work on this book my first time. Doing all the different voices really reminded me of uh, when I was a kid entertaining my sister with different voices. So it was fun to reconnect with that kind of sensibility. Um, as for the voices themselves, they, it was really, it was a joint effort, I think, between uh, Jeff had some ideas, Nick had some ideas, Maureen had some great ideas, and then I brought some ideas in. And we kind of figured uh -huh. out some of the main uh, alien characters, like the Aurora, the main Aurora, Marf is kind of like a Kathleen Turner, kind of like a Lauren Bacall sort of voice. And then there's one, and Edgar is kind of a Don Rickles-ish type of personality. 
And there's one alien, if you listen closely, who I decided was Kermit the Frog. And <laughs> in terms of keeping uh, that stable throughout the read, thank you so much to our engineers who were able, who were of course capturing everything. And then when I would stop in the middle of a chapter and go, wait, who was, who was this voice again that could play it back for me? And then I could jump right back into it. Jeff, can you tell us more about what that and what you were actually wanting and thinking for a narrator? Sure. One of the challenges, there's a couple of challenges with this book. Uh, one of them being that, you know, it's, it's about a family of humans who immigrate to an alien planet and there's four different species of alien, all of which have very, very different vocalizations in their native language. And then that's complicated by the fact that then in translation, they have the voices, as Danny was saying, like Kathleen Turner or Kermit the Frog or Don Rickles, depending on who they are. But um, one of the things that's a little unusual about the book and was really only possible to pull off because it was a story about a human kid who spends most of the book surrounded by aliens who know nothing of humans, was that I, I never specify in the text what the gender of land the main character is. And, um, and when we initially, when, when we were initially casting the audio book, you know, Nick uh, had, had male voices and female voices, and we kind of both agreed it, they were a little too gendered in what we, what, because we, I, the ideal is to be able, for any kid or adult who listens to the book to be able, you know, to see themselves in the, in the narrator and in the story. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I said, Nick, is there, is there any other option? And Nick, said, well, you know, Nick came up with Danny and, and I said, that sounds, that's fantastic and it's perfect. And, you know, they're non-binary. Um, I did, actually didn't know that when I listened to the audition. I just thought this is a very good, it's an excellent sort of down the middle. It doesn't sound too, you know, too gendered one way or another. So it just, Danny just wound up, wound up being the perfect person for it. And I'm so grateful for that. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, can you tell us then um, a bit about the clip that you're going to, or that Danny, that you're going to read? Jeff actually chose this clip and I said wholehearted yes. I think this is, this clip is, is fun because it's Lan's first time really interacting with truly sympathetic aliens and it's a bit of a reversal because that's at this moment these two aliens who look quite intimidating have just broken into the house where Land's family has been staying and has been barricaded away and kept safe from most of the aliens on the planet Chum, who are the jury, who think in very particular ways about humans and human culture. And Lan is about to get a crash course in these two specific aliens. Danny, we are looking forward to hearing um, this little clip, this clip that you're going to uh, read for us and look forward to hearing those wonderful voices and having you take us to the planet Chum. Take it away. Who sent you here? I asked. No one, said Marv. That was a lie I told the guards so they would not know I overrode the security features on the fence. But don't worry. You are safe from the protesters. Only the Aurora are clever enough to override a fence, and none of them would bother to come here except me. I had so many questions that I almost didn't know where to start. So, why did you come here? Just for the food? Esger sniffed the chow and made a face. That would have been a big mistake, he growled. This food looks terrible. We came to convert you to our religion. Marv told me. Really? Oh, yes. Marv's mouth turned up even further. This time I was sure it was a smile. Its rituals are very painful. As part of the initiation, Esger will have to chew off one of your arms. But you will find great spiritual meaning in your suffering. A little surge of fear shot straight to my brain. I'm so sorry. I said, but I already have a religion. That is fine, said Marv. I was only making a joke. Do humans have jokes? Yes. Do you? Marv does, said Esger, but her jokes are never funny. Only because you have no sense of humor, Esger, Marv told him. 
Esger shrugged and went back to examining our chow with a look of disgust. I thought people on Chum didn't like jokes, I said. Marv shook her enormous head. Oh no, the jury government doesn't like jokes, but that is very different. Tell me a human joke. Thank you so much, Danny, that was great. It brought me right back into that world. Appreciated. We are grateful, Ojali Haliga written by Tracy Sorrell and read for you by Lauren Hummingbird, Agalasiga McKee, Ryan McKee, Tracy Sorrell, and Tanya Weevil. Produced by Live Oak Media. Narrated by a carefully chosen cast from the Cherokee community, this dynamic journey through the four seasons utilizes music and sound effects to create an audio landscape that provides a rich understanding of Cherokee language, culture, and customs. And now, please enjoy this conversation with the team involved in creating this production. Welcome to the um, Odyssey 2020 Honor Presentation for the book, We Are Grateful, Odalee Haliga by Tracy Sorrell and produced by Deborah and Arnie Cardillo of Live Oak Media. So um, at this point, I would like to um, offer congratulations for the production um, of this uh, wonderful, wonderful audio and say thank you to Deborah and Arnie for such a wonderful production and say congratulations <laughs> and offer you this honor award. Well, we, we really appreciate the recognition. Um, uh, we, we certainly would like to thank ALA and Booklist for supporting this award. For, uh, since uh, its inception, we especially want to thank the committee. We know, uh, we know how much is involved in, in going through the selection process. And uh, you're going to ask us today how we do a production. Someday I want to know how you guys select titles. Because <laughs> it's, really, it's really an amazing process. Um, we, uh, Megan Quinn at uh, Charles Bridge, she always offers us the most challenging titles to put onto audio. And uh, she offered, uh, we are grateful. And uh, after looking at the book, you know, we just said, how can we do this? But how can we not do it? Uh, how can we not do it? <laughs> but how can we do it? It, it? it cries out for authenticity. So I asked Megan, I said, can I just speak to Tracy? Uh, and, I, and I realized that Tracy was part of the Cherokee Nation and the community, and um, I could not do it without her. So I called her, and she was on board. And uh, I'll let her speak to the fact that she did all the casting. Uh, I did, you know, we did all the, she and I directed the sessions, and I, uh, of course, did all the post-production back in New York. But, um, but Tracy, why don't you talk a little about uh, uh, the, process. the process and how you were involved? Uh, first of all, wado to the ALA Odyssey community members for this wonderful honor. It's incredible. Uh, myself and the other narrators are so honored to have. Um, the audiobook recognized, and I've heard so many um, positive comments from listeners who really enjoyed the book. It enhances what they've read in the book by having the audiobook. And um, again, this is my first debut book, so I really don't know what other experiences with audiobooks are, but I would say this is a fantastic first experience. Um, as Arnie mentioned, you know, he contacted me directly. We had a conversation and um, he's right. You know, the book was done with the consultation of my fellow Cherokee citizens along with my family. And I felt like the audiobook needed to be the same way. And he did too. So um, the narration actually was recorded pretty quickly over a three week period last April. I had reached out to Ryan Mackey, and the clip that we're going to hear is set in summer. He is part of our tribe's Master Language Apprentice Program, which helps educate adults to go out and be teachers of the language to our children. 
And the other narrators, he brought in his son, who I know, Chuji Makior, um, Aga Lisiga, which is his um, given Cherokee name. He brought him in um, to read, and he reads the winter section. Lauren Hummingbird is a fellow um, language teacher in our tribe's immersion school. She reads for spring. And then the Cherokee Heritage Center education director, Tanya Hogner Weevil, reads fall. So um, I start out by reading the first page in the book and I read some of the back matter, but Arnie and I really wanted a variety of voices for you could hear different Cherokee people and what different, you know, accents are. Also the different ways people pronounce the language. It's just like any other language where, you know, different parts of the Cherokee nation, people have different pronunciation styles. And um, Mary Kay Henderson is our Cherokee nation national youth choir director. She and her husband have a studio behind their home. And so I reached out to her and uh, her husband, Brad, and um, his partner, Pat Savage, who, who served as sound engineer for this. You know, like I say, we recorded it over three weeks. It didn't take three weeks, but it went really smoothly. And then Arnie um, worked with Brad and uh, Pat, you know, to put the language together. But as you read through the story, there are a number of things that the reader's experiencing, right? Learning about stickball, learning about these other things. So you need to have those authentic sounds and working with people from the Cherokee Nation and Brad and them, that's how, you know, we're able to incorporate those. The book, it speaks to the nation and all people who represent the nation, young and old. So uh, the fact that the book was divided into seasons allowed us to consider multiple uh, narrators and it also, we did select uh, younger and, uh, and older narrators to represent the, the, the entire community. So that was important to try to capture as well. Tracy, with the clip that we're going to play um, with Summer and what you're going to read for us, can you tell us what are we going to hear and what you read and what we hear in the clip? Mm -hmm. Um, I'll start off by reading the first page of the book, which kind of sets the stage for the fact that as Cherokee people, we are taught to be grateful all year long, every day and every season, not just for wonderful things that happen in our life, but also the challenges. And it really, an, an integral part of Cherokee culture is living in that balance and recognizing that hard times come at the same time as good times. And I certainly think we've all experienced that within the pandemic, you know? I mean, I have friends who are having babies, at the same time, friends are losing family members and we've all had that. So that is just how life operates. Um, and that sets us up for what we experience in each season. Summer is not any more special than any other season, um, certainly, you know, but what we see in this clip is um, our current life, right? We've got um, gigging, crawdads we've got you know crops being um, coming to maturation and we're you know harvesting the crops kids are playing stickball that is an ancient game of war that has evolved into a social game and so again that's something that Cherokee people know but you also hear the sounds of that and that's explained in the back matter and then we close with um, a very important event for us which is the Cherokee national holiday that happens every Labor Day so there are other Cherokee people. The Eastern Band in North Carolina are our relatives, but they did not, they stayed behind and did not get removed in the forced removal. And when we gather at Labor Day for the Cherokee National Holiday, that spread there that um, the last one that Ryan reads um, that shows our courthouse and which has now uh, been turned into a museum, but that was actually our first Capitol building after that forced removal, we had to reform our government in 1839. And so we meet every September over Labor Day weekend to celebrate signing our constitution again, because September 6th of 1839 is when we did that. So it's a very important part of Cherokee history, but we celebrate that and we come together each year with traditional games. The chief in that spread is giving the state of the nation address. And, and it's an important time because we recognize that our ancestors, you know, did survive and they did reform the nation and we carried on our culture and our language. And it's a powerful um, image. Like I say, not that it's more important than the others, but I feel like that brings all of that together. And then it's being read, like I say, by Ryan, who is integral 
in the ongoing efforts to teach our language, have our adults be certified as language teachers to make sure the language stays and continues through our children. Cherokee people say Ojali Haliga to express gratitude. It is a reminder to celebrate our blessings and reflect on struggles daily throughout the year and across the seasons. Oh, Jali Heliga, we are grateful. So oh, thank you. I, this book, I mean, you know, there's a huge part of it would not be what it is without Frenet's illustrations. Yeah. And then, like I say, you add the audio book into it and it, it just pops. It just pops. It's just the, the complete package. And I'm so grateful. Well, just so uh, Deborah and Arnie have done an amazing job and thank you so much to all of you for sharing your gifts and talents with our children and our youth. Yeah, well, thank you very much and thank you for the recognition and Tracy, we love you. Thank you <laughs> for all of your hard work. Yep. Yes. Wait for the next one. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> Golgi, summer. As the crops mature and the sun scorches, we say Ojali Heliga. Golgi. Golgi. Summer. When we grasp our gigs and wade into the cool creek to catch crawdads for supper. As we sink our teeth into the season's first harvest at the green corn ceremony. While we click clack sticks, chase a small ball, and fling it high at the stick ball game pole. When we recall the ancestor sacrifices to preserve our way of life. To celebrate Lulistani Dola history and listen to our tribal leaders speak at Cherokee National Holiday. Lulistani Dola. Lulistani Dola. History. Every day. Every season. Ojali Heliga. We are grateful. The 2020 Odyssey Award goes to Scholastic Audiobooks for Hey Kiddo, How I Lost My Mother, Found My Father, and Dealt With Family Addiction. Written by Jarrett Krasowska and narrated by Jarrett Krasowska, Jeannie Birdsall, Jenna Lomia, Richard Ferrone, and a full cast. In a deeply personal production, Jarrett, with a full cast including his friends and family, adapts his graphic memoir. Every carefully crafted element from... Well, hold on. I'm getting a transmission from the 1980s that might just show you. Hey, kiddo. Bonus chapter. The Odyssey Medal. It was the summer of 1990. I found a leftover fortune cookie on the kitchen counter. Whoa. Grandma! Grandma! Guess what? <sighs> Jesus, Mary and Joseph, what is it, yeah? Can't you see I'm watching my program? I just got a fortune that reads, In the summer of 2020, you will win the Odyssey Award for the audiobook adaptation of your graphic memoir, Hey Kiddo. What in the hell does that even mean? Well, I think it means that I'll grow up to write a comic about my life. Who would want to read that? Sounds stupid. Oh, Grandma. No, look. I'll publish a comic, and then they'll adapt it to be an audiobook. And... An audiobook? You mean, like, books on tape or something? Uh, yeah. Huh. Won't need many tapes. What in the hell would the story even be about? Well, us, I suppose. Yeah, right. 
No, it'll be a really special production. We'll even get a lot of the real people to voice themselves. Is that so? When does this happen again? 2020. 2020? For Christ's sake, I'll be dead by then. They better get some hot number to voice me. And who's gonna voice you? You'll be too old. I don't know. Probably some cool kid with a really bright future. Yeah, all right. Well, good. Now get the hell out of the way, will ya? My show is coming back on. I would like to offer my congratulations to the entire team that worked on this and would like to present to you, Paul, the Odyssey Medal for Hey Kiddo. Thank you, Sharon Hope, and the members of your amazing 2020 Odyssey Committee. It's a huge honor to have Hey Kiddo chosen as the first audiobook of a work of graphic literature to receive the Odyssey Medal. I deeply miss being together with all of you at an ALA conference today, but it feels very fitting to be part of another first, a virtual Odyssey celebration. Thank you to ALSK, YALSA, and Booklist for organizing this today and for your support of this award. If you've listened to all of Hey Kiddo, you're already familiar with the story of how we turned Jarrett J. Krasowska's graphic memoir into an audiobook. Jarrett covers most of it in his About This Audiobook section at the end of the recording. So I'm not going to retell that story here, but I'd like to fill in a few of the early background details for this project. For me, it really began with producing audiobooks of two titles by Sherry Priest, I Am Princess X and The Agony House. Both of these books are primarily narrative fiction, with short graphic novel-style sequences interspersed between chapters. The narrative portions of both of these titles were pretty straightforward single-voice audiobook readings, but we had decided on a full production approach to adapting the graphic sequences, adding music, sound effects, and multiple voices. These projects whet my appetite to take that full production approach on an audiobook of an entire graphic novel. I started seriously looking at some of the titles on Scholastic's graphics list. At the ALA's 2018 annual conference in New Orleans, I was in the audience when Jarrett Krasowska was among a group of Scholastic authors in a Reader's Theater presentation of excerpts from their forthcoming books. I had been among the millions of viewers who watched Jarrett's powerfully moving TED Talk on YouTube, and I was excited to see that with Hey Kiddo, he was telling his own story in the form of a graphic memoir. I listened to the presentation, and it was a light bulb moment. This was exactly the graphic literature audiobook project I'd been hoping for. The key to adapting Hey Kiddo as an audiobook was to seamlessly marry narration, dialogue, and sound effects so that an audiobook listener would have the same story experience as a reader of the printed book. This required the creation of a script that incorporated text, Jarrett's hand-lettered narration, and word balloon dialogue. We worked closely with Jarrett to create additional narration and dialogue to bridge the visual storytelling elements of the illustrations into an audio narrative. I'd like to thank Scholastic Audio's editor, John Pells, for his help on that first script, which became a roadmap that continued to evolve throughout the production. We also drew up a detailed list of every character with spoken lines of dialogue in the book and began to think about casting. It was a given that Jarrett would do both the narration and the dialogue for his teen self. I'd worked with Jarrett before when he narrated the Weston Woods animated film of his picture book, Peanut Butter and Jellyfish, so he'd already passed the audition for this with flying colors. But that left over 70 characters to be cast. At Jarrett's request, we had the additional challenge of finding people who could do convincing Wusta accents. I made the early suggestions of Richard Ferrone, who provided a solid emotional foundation as Jarrett's grandfather, Joe, and Jenna Lamia, who brought a heartbreaking vulnerability to her performance as Jarrett's mom, Leslie. Thank you, Richard and Jenna, for bringing so much heart and soul to this production. I'd also like to add my personal thanks to the readers we chose from Jarrett's multicast live recordings of the book, including Jeannie Birdsall, Joey Krasowska, and Jaden Meltzer, and to Jarrett's family members, former teachers, and friends who so generously stepped up to contribute to this production. Having their voices in the audiobook made for a natural extension of something Jared did in the book art, using his childhood drawings and portions of letters from his parents as collage elements. I want to thank our composer, Scotty Huff, for creating music for this audiobook, 
and John Van Horn, who assembled the best line readings out of many hours of voice recordings. And a big thank you to my colleague, Melissa Ellard, and our production team at Weston Woods and Scholastic Audio, and especially Steve Sciardo. Steve is a true artist in sound, and what you hear in the recording is the result of his skillful editing and mixing of hundreds of sound elements into a seamless, unified whole. And heartfelt thanks to our president at Scholastic Audio, Laurie Benton, for saying yes to this project and for her trust and enthusiastic support every day. And to my wife, Lynn, and our daughters, Melanie and Brianna, for their support every day. Most of all, I'd like to thank Jarrett for trusting us with your story and for being such a fantastic collaborator and a good friend. I should also mention how much I appreciated your steadfast patience and determination throughout this project, especially when a recording studio snafu resulted in having to record most of the narration and dialogue not just once, but twice. I hope we'll get to do many more projects together. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce and turn things over to Jared. Thank you. Thank you. The making of the Hey Kiddo audiobook it was a profound journey for me to take, a true odyssey of personal growth. With the print edition of Hey Kiddo, I started the journey of healing from childhood trauma. With the audiobook, I was able to finish that healing and mending. And, you know, an author's role in an audiobook adaptation of their work is, is typically pretty passive. Uh, but Paul Gagne pulled me in from the very beginning and then quickly elevated me to the role of co-director. Regardless of that fancy title, I bow down to Paul and all of the incredible leadership that he offered this project. This would have gone nowhere without his steadfast leadership. Now, we quickly realized together, as we learned on the job, that uh, a good amount of work had to be done to adapt a story that was predominantly told with visuals and have that be told with audio. With each pass, we noticed we were missing parts of the story. Even if a character had a cocked eyebrow, we needed to have an audible sigh so the listeners could experience with their ears what the viewers of the book were experiencing with their eyes. None of those sound effects would have gone anywhere if it weren't for the incomparable Steve Sayardo. He went as to so far to, in designing the soundscape to go to a Goodwill, buy an old pair of corduroy pants, and swish them together in front of the microphone to recreate the sound of the young Jarrett walking many steps behind his mother, who was at the time high on drugs. Every single member of the Scholastic Audiobook family, thank you so much for being so supportive. Uh, you took steps to transform this graphic memoir in a way that uh, we, I didn't even know it could be done uh, when we stepped into this. Now, I will forever be in gratitude uh, for Scholastic Graphics for taking on Hey Kiddo. It's so outside of their normal repertoire, and I will forever be thankful and to my friend David Levithan for, for, for getting the story out of me and getting it out into the world. We were doing these live reads uh, before uh, we even knew there'd be an audiobook, and National Book Award winning author Jeannie Birdsall surprised us all with the secret skill of acting as she performed as Shirley. I'm so so lucky that she was hired uh, and cast in the audiobook production. You know, Jeannie, this is what Jeannie did. She, she took my grandmother, who w was a very gruff and, and difficult person, but also a very loving. And, and that, that complicated love comes through in Jeannie's performance. And Richard Ferrone, Man, he did such a masterful job voicing my grandfather, Joe. Uh, Richard performed as I remembered my grandfather to be. Beleaguered and unflappable and full of humor. And Jenna Lamia, Jenna Lamia as my mother, Leslie. Oh my goodness. I, I just could not have asked for a better performance. You know, here is a, my, my mother, Leslie, a woman who... Uh, clearly loves her kid, but is besieged by this addiction that, that prevents her from physically being there. And Jenna brought such beautiful vulnerability to that role. Now, all three of you could have played these characters as, as one-note stereotypes. The drunk, the addict, but you didn't. You brought them to life to the listeners and readers, and, and you brought the real people alive back to me again as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, the part of Jarrett 
of the different parts of my life were performed by Zoe Krasowska and Jaden Meltzer. And these young performers stood toe to toe to the seasoned audiobook narrators. I'm so very proud of you and I look forward to cheering your artistic endeavors for decades to come. To Gina, Lucia, Xavier, my other family members, thank you for your patience as the production of this did take me away for many hours and you had to listen to me talk about this for months and months and months and you also stepped outside of your own comfort zone to come into the recording booth to record as well. Thank you so much. I love you. Now, uh, everyone, if I, if I could, just may, uh, just, just give me a moment. I would like to speak directly to my family and friends in Worcester, Massachusetts. Dudes, this is a big freaking deal. Like, like huge. Like, like, okay, of all the audiobooks that came out last year, in 2019, the Odyssey committee chose, hey kiddo, I can't thank you enough. Like, you know how the, the Pats would not be six time Super Bowl champions if it weren't for Tom Brady? You are my Tom Brady in this situation. But, but with none of that leaving for Tampa Bay BS, right? But whatever, that is neither here nor there. I appreciate you all coming in and, and laying down some tracks. I love you to the moon and back. And finally, to the Odyssey Committee, I want to thank you for elevating this work with a citation of the Odyssey Medal. It was a thrill to get a call from you that fateful January afternoon, and I so wish we could be celebrating together in person. I know someday that we will. In the meantime, I want you to know something very important. With your hard work, there are countless readers who can now feel seen. Readers who do not have access to the print edition of Hey Kiddo will now have access to this story regardless of their sight ability. You know, when I, when I was young, I thought I was the only kid uh, in my school, in my town, in my state, in the country that was being raised by grandparents because of his mother's uh, opioid addiction disorder. Your elevation of Hey Kiddo with that shiny gold sticker on the cover will ensure that readers everywhere that we serve will not feel lonely. Thank you. I have the great pleasure and honor of introducing the cast and um, crew, so to speak, of Hey Kiddo, who are going to present a live reading for us right now. So we have Jaden Meltzer, Jeannie Birdsall, Jenna Lamia, Richard Ferrone, Jarrett Krasowska, and Zoe Krasowska, who are going to do a live reading for us now. Um, we look forward to hearing this clip and uh, this piece, and if you could maybe tell us a little bit what we're going to hear before you start, that would be really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we are going to uh, read the first part of chapter seven, Ghost. And I, I selected this portion uh, because it really lets all of the actors shine in some, some great moments for these quote unquote characters. And while Jaden Meltzer did not voice the dialogue for the older Jarrett, Jaden voiced the dialogue for the, the tween in between Jarrett. I wanted him to come on so he could have a part uh, and, and show his talents. And also uh, my daughter Zoe, as well, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to read as it appears in the audiobook, and visually you'll see what the print book. So you'll see a little bit about how, what we had to add. You really, if you want to leave Zoe after you read your line, I know you're excited for this library session. Okay. When I was a kid, I draw to get attention from my family. I made this for you, mommy. In junior high. I drew to impress my friends. When I grow up, I want to be a cartoonist. But now that I'm in my teens, I fill sketchbooks just to deal with life, to survive. You spend time dealing with the ghosts of the past, they'll continue to haunt you. Problem is, the ghosts wouldn't leave me alone. I needed to face them. I put all of my thoughts, fears, and hopes into the drawings in my sketchbooks. Some drawings are little interpretations of what's going on around me. But other times, it's easier for me to be less specific. Surreal monsters drawn in graphite help me channel all of my anger, frustration, and rage. <laughs> on the evening of Christmas, it was usually just me, Joe, and Shirley. 
Christmas Eve was always the big Krasoska family party. And then Joey, Steve, Lynn, and Holly would be with their new families and in-laws on Christmas Day. But at this Christmas dinner, we had a guest. Hello? Jesus Christ, would it kill you to call and say you're going to be late? You don't need to wait on me, Ma. Don't worry, we didn't. Hi, Dad. Hi, Les. So, was Santa good to you, Jer? Yeah, he came down my chimney and everything. Filled up my stocking. It was weird. Having my mother back around. Well, Santa gave me my wish. I'm here with you. How was Miguel? He's good. You know, maybe sometime he could you know, come over for... No, the answer is no. Um, who's Miguel? My boyfriend. Oh, you'll love him, Jack. I can't wait for you to meet him. Where'd you meet him? Well, we go way, way back, but uh, we, we just met up again at the clinic. I think he had a thing for me back in the day. Can you blame him? We ended up in the same release program, and he finally built up the nerve to ask me out. Ah, romance at the clinic. <laughs> yeah. What about you, kiddo? You have a special someone? No. So, you still drawing? I hear you got a cartoon in the paper. Yep. The year always seemed to get sucked out of the room whenever Leslie stepped into it. At least we had my grandmother to lighten the mood. You know, I hate Christmas. Huh? Well, I think about all the people who don't got nothing. You know? And then on the news, they always show people whose houses burnt down at Christmas time. And then they really got nothing, you know? And then I think about all the wives who get beat by their husbands. Just gets me down is all. So jolly. That was so great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us today and experiencing the wonder, imagination, joy, comfort and satisfaction of a beautifully narrated well-told tale hope to see you in chicago in 2021